Okay, let's get going. Welcome everyone to the second session of uh, our Earthwork Group. Um, So um, first, thanks to um, Hannes and George for taking notes for us this time. Yeah, thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Um, this is the not well. Again, this governs everything that we do at ITF. So please make sure um, to familiarize yourself with this. If you're not familiar with this, it's really important to, to know what this means. Um, please um, use the meet echo to sign in here to allow us to know how many people are in the room. Um, this allows us to kind of plan for future meetings and uh, make sure we have room big enough to to host us. Yeah. So, and also it allows you to um, it allows you to. Um, get in the queue and, and have comments and questions. Okay. So here's uh, our schedule for today. We have a packed agenda, so let's get going very quickly. So um, Mike and Aaron will be talking about protected resources metadata. Um, Oliver and Daniel will be talking about SDJotVC. Um, Paul will be talking about attestation-based client authentication. Aaron will be giving us an update about browser-based apps. Uh, Peter will be talking about uh, cross-device flows, and Paul will uh, wrap it up with OAuth status list. Any questions about the agenda? Any bashing here? If not, let's get going. Hello, I'm Mike Jones, and my partner in crime in this venture is Aaron Parecki. Next, I don't think I don't know if it works. Stein. Got it. Um, okay, so quick recap on what this <clears throat> specification is for. This is the uh, now called resource server metadata, previously combined with authorization server discovery. Uh, the point of this, though, is for clients like, for example, mail apps or calendar apps, specifically, uh, those are good examples because they don't have their own relationship with an OAuth or authorization server, because the whole point of those apps is that you can use whatever account you want with them with that application. So usually the way these work is the first thing you do when you set up the application is you actually tell it what server you want it to go and talk to. And uh, currently, the user experience of that varies pretty differently depending on the application being used. Um, in the case of this screenshot from the Apple, uh, I believe that's in the settings app in Apple, uh, you enter the server address of your mail server, and then it does things. Uh, sometimes it asks you for a password. Sometimes it asks you for OAuth login, whatever. So the point of this is to have a standard way to um, do an OAuth flow for these applications, because currently, most of the time, they are asking for a password for this, which is uh, not good for a number of reasons and not possible in some servers that have decided to turn that off and force you into an actual OAuth flow.
It is not advancing. It's not. Okay. okay. So what's happened since we last met our heroes in San Francisco? Um, we got working group feedback and reviews on the document. We incorporated that. Um, and uh, after that, um, let's see. Uh, we addressed many of the comments when we published the 01 draft. And if you're interested in the issues that we addressed, you can uh, view the set of closed issues in the GitHub. Next. Okay, there's only two open questions we know of about the draft. Um, I'll take the first one. Um, should the WWW Authenticate response return the resource identifier or possibly a resource metadata URL that might include the dot well-known path uh, built into it. Um, currently, it returns the resource identifier, which is the, was the original design. Um, I'll note that um, a fairly recent OAuth RFC, the resource indicators draft that has the resource equals identifier uh, does use the resource identifier as the resource value. Um, so unless people really want to make a case that we should do something different, I think we'll do the same thing. Um, the, I was hoping we had an example of this in the slide deck, but it looks like we don't, unfortunately. So you'll have to just use your imagination to picture what that looks like. Um, the, the main difference between those two being the resource identifier is uh, just like the URL that identifies the resource server. The resource metadata URL is built on top of that. So using the dot well-known construct that we use for a lot of other parts of OAuth, like authorization server metadata, um, there's a handful of other things that we use it for, we would, um, the, the client would have to construct the URL for the metadata based on just that base URL, um, which is related, but a slightly different question from the second question. I guess, George, you want to say something about that first point? Yeah. Okay. So if I remember correctly, when we were going through the resource identifier, resource indicators draft, the resource indicator itself can be logical. So it doesn't have to be a URI to something. It could be a URN. And in that context, would that make it more difficult for someone to find the stuff they're looking for? So is there value in basically specifying that this thing in the www-authenticate should be a pointer to actual metadata, like the full URI? URL to it rather than a potential logical indicator, which is what's allowed in the RFC. Um, I should look at resource indicators again. I thought that that was a URL to the resource. It's URI. Yeah, partly because I was arguing for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, Justin Richer, uh, all of the problems that George just listed, plus um, the fact that you're actually not supposed to do a dot well known on anything that has a path already. Um, no, there is a defined way to do it, and the AS metadata says how to do it. That's fair. Um, that's also a little odd uh, how it's done, and I realize that you know we don't want to make Mark Nottingham mad, but. Um, <sighs> For both of these reasons, sort of the the weird quirks in composition, which are quite possible to get wrong, plus the uh, the logical identifier that is not a fetchable URL, um, I would argue that we should explore uh, possibly returning both under separate keys. Um, but with the caveat that if we allow that, then we have to be very clear about what the relationship between those has to be, which is actually related to the second point on the slide here. Um, in It's pretty much the same underlying issue. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I say we allow both. I don't know what the 
requirement would be for one requiring one versus the other for interop sake. I lean towards URL because I would know that that's fetchable, but that's not going to be universal. The other um, the argument I can see for returning the URL is that, uh, like you said, with the possibility of a URN or the possibility of getting the path construction wrong, um, returning the www authenticate header is kind of the way to skirt all those issues if the value of it is the URL of the metadata. Then you kind of just avoid all the issues in the first place. And that would be the right. reason to use it as opposed to not use it and assume the client can just find the metadata. Because if it, we're talking about like you punch in a URL to this client and the client has two options. One, it can just try to find the metadata if it knows the dot well-known construct, which might work. Um, or it could fetch that URL and get a WW Authenticate header back, which would then have the actual path to the metadata, which could then could be uh, whatever. So that, that, that feels like it gives the WW Authenticate header a reason to exist instead of just it being like a nice thing. I, I think there's actually a cogent argument for both because the logical identifier, if the resource indicator is the logical identifier, then that may have meaning to the client beyond just the metadata location. And if the other is, this is the metadata location, regardless of what the logical identifier is, then you know we, we're very clear as to what each of them means and what you're supposed to do with them. Yeah. What's unclear is the relationship between them, which is exactly the state that got us into the uh, AS mix-up attack uh, space with <laughs> AS discovery documents in the first place. So. We have to be careful there, but I think that there is a cogent argument for both. Uh, Philip Skokan, Okta here. Um, we do like the fact that the resource indicators allow it allows a URN, um, or a, sorry, a URI, um, but I don't think that's applicable here because of the nature of the use case that you explained where you enter um, a random, uh, not, a, not a random, uh, arguably, um, a URL to explore the server you want to talk to. And I think that when you hit a when you hit a resource, if the www authenticate gave you a URI, there's no way to resolve that to um, the well known. Uh, by the way, we already made Mark unhappy in OpenID Foundation because the mm -hmm. discovery uh, 1.0 in OpenID behaves not conform, <laughs> while the one this is RFC 8414 for all does this correctly when you have path included. So we should definitely be very explicit about you know, what we reference in, uh, in this way. But I was actually thinking that it, it should just return the URL to its well-known document. And you may discover the, the resource value to use in that document. So either you return both of them at the same time or you discover it. And I think that leads to the second question as well. Um, however, because of the dynamic nature of this, I don't think that returning a URI should be allowed altogether um, because I, I would assume the URI is something that you would have to pre-register with uh, an issuer, whereas a URL allows for the, dynam the dynam dynamic nature of this. Good argument, thank you. Brian. It just sort of following up on Philip said, the resource indicators does allow for a URI, but it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be allowed for here. And certainly it could be constrained to be a URL. It probably would be in the deployment models. The URI was kind of more for, like you said, pre pre-configured kind of ways to identify a resource or group of resources and so forth. Um, so I don't know if that's it. The, the idea of returning the full, um, yeah, uh, URI to the metadata itself is, I think, compelling, but clients aren't the only one. The idea with well-known is clients aren't the only one that are maybe looking to discover this. Uh, we, there's use cases for an AS to figure it out. So I'm not quite sure how to reconcile that. And just lastly, on the well-known path construction, this, uh, the way it's done in here, I think makes a lot of sense for how it's works and what people's expectations would be, but it does run counter to what the naughty hands, et cetera, would, would want to see. And I'm, I'm concerned that we're sort of setting ourselves up for another, um, you know, deployment where this, where the sort of what makes sense and works that we have now, it gets used and deployed. And then we hit 
feedback in ISG review that forces a change that's really nasty um, and, and causes you know, variance and incompatibility issues. And I don't know what to do about it because I like what it does now, but I'm, I'm worried about the, the future state of progressing the draft. So, Brian, um, you obliquely pointed out that um, other parties than the client might also use this metadata. One of the things we explicitly did for this latest published draft was address your comment yeah. saying that the server might also use the metadata. Uh, to the Mark Nottingham point, uh, for better or for worse, it already uses the language like AS metadata where uh, it puts the path at the end of the well-known so that the well-known is already in the root. I don't like that either. I've, yeah, that's what the draft does. I misread it then. We, we can both read it again, but having fought that fought and lost for AS metadata, I didn't try to win it again, especially given I've had side conversations with Mark on this topic. Um, in the last six months. And Mark Nottingham's point of view is the web security model is based on um, what's, what's the, not, there's a web origin, web, web origins. Now I, I do note that cookies can include paths, so that's not strictly true, but uh, for the most part, he's right. Roman. Uh, hi, Roman Dinelius, AD. Uh, if we're trying to reduce IESG surprise, one of the things we could do is hit, I was just checking the review directorates that we could ask. It sounds like we could ask the HTTP directorate yeah. for an early review on this specific mechanism. And so if you had a clean review from that directorate when it comes to the ISG, I think that they might find it difficult to suggest something contrary to the directorate review, or perhaps they're going to suggest it. Yeah. That's so a good idea. You could ask now. Yeah, but we could definitely do that. that that's fine. Yeah. Brian, you're still in the queue, or are you done? OK, Neil. You uh, are, sorry. Uh, this is Neil Jenkins, Fastmail. Um, just a few thoughts on this. Firstly, um, the URL, I think, would be a lot easier from our perspective than um, trying to I'll back up slightly. Uh, this kind of thing is really interesting to us. And last week, we got a group of a lot of the big email providers and various other clients together to try and uh, work on a, a profile, if you like, a flow that uses just the existing OAuth draft to actually make dynamic client registration work. So you can do exactly this sort of thing, connecting to your contacts or calendar stuff. Because um, at the moment, no one does this. It's not there. Uh, so this kind of thing is obviously very relevant to that. Um, I think, yes, firstly, being able to return the URL directly to the resource metadata is going to be a lot easier for people to use and understand than the other alternative. Secondly, I looked through the, this draft, and I can't see anything about how you find what scope you need to get these, because that's obviously really important. Um, we have some thoughts on, on that we're looking at, but just wonder whether it was meant to be anything related to this. Um, and then. I have something on the next question, but I think you haven't got to that yet, so I'll maybe wait. So to the scope question, which is a good one, uh, OAuth Core 6749 does say that WWW Authenticate can return the scope that you need to do an operation, and you can have multiple things in WW Authenticate, so it's a building block, and okay. we're not touching that part of it. Okay, great. Did we really not mention scope at all in the draft? Because I thought we had a sentence about it somewhere. It's... I only skimmed it, but I couldn't see anything at okay. least saying that, I, which would be useful. The WWL Authenticate header can return scope, so we should at least mention that part in the draft, along with and an example, the WWL correct. Authenticate header that's in this draft, or at least put it in the example. Um, the, the scope problem is a hard problem because you <clears throat> almost need scopes to be interoperable for the use case you're talking about, which is that's a different something we're looking problem. at as well, yes. Yeah. Um, okay. What there so, is in the draft about scopes is there's a scopes supported metadata value. 
um, which by the way, we changed the name as a result of feedback to match the name uh, in the AS metadata. So uh, when you fetch the metadata, you can see that um, at least a subset, the publicly published scope values that are supported. And if those are meaningful to you, you use them. Okay, J just one second here. Um, we have four minutes and you still have a few slides and you have a few people in the, in the yeah, queue. Let's, so let's... let's. Uh, I think uh, this is actually the last slide we care about. Okay, yeah. so, um, so let's, let's get Brian. Okay, Brian. Brian? Oh, he's... Okay, Dimitri. Thanks. Uh, so as, as a data point, um, the solid project does use something very similar mechanism. So returns a dub dub authenticate uh, response header, uh, except it, instead of the level of indirection of pointing to the resource and then constructing the AS metadata, it links to the AS server directly. So I was just wondering what, um, and apologies if this was already discussed, but what, what's the reason against doing that? That is how this started. Um, with the other draft that I had written, which was the www authenticate header points to the AS. I believe there were arguments um, around, I can't remember the exact arguments, but it should be captured somewhere either in previous meetings or in issues. Um, and it made more sense to do the, to point to the metadata, which can then point to the AS. The RS metadata can point to the AS in that document. In particular, it's a set of ASs in general that your, your resource might say, I can work with A, B, or C. And then it's up to the client. Would you consider an optional mechanism for a preferred AS just to skip on the extra HTTP call? It's an interesting question. Let's discuss that. Um, on the yeah, mailing so list? just in the last, yeah, on, on the list. Okay. Um, just quick on bullet two, since we only have two minutes left. The the main question here, no, back, um, is let's assume that we've now decided that the full URL is returned in that www authenticate header. What happens if you make a request to example.com for the resource and that returns the authenticate header with a metadata document that's at a completely different host name, example.org? Um, is it okay? Does it is it bad? Does it let you do interesting things that are good? Does it enable interesting things that are bad? Um, at the very least, I think the, the you would need a kind of like back link, like the metadata document should say, yes, this is a metadata document for example.com, um, so that you can do that that bidirectional confirmation. So this is an open question. Um, we don't have any time here to discuss it, but this list, is, yeah. if you have any thoughts about this, this will be another good one to chime in on. Uh, both of these are open issues on the GitHub repository. So feel free to go there to um, to find those links or just on the mailing list is fine. Awesome. I think that's it. OK. Um, so at least as we saw it a couple days ago when we made the slides, the next steps for this draft are to resolve open issues. And if it looks like we're in a good place with working group consensus, ask for working group last call. But it sounds like to me, you can double check me that we take a pass at returning the metadata path directly, see what that looks out, try to write security considerations and normative text for the latter point and take it from there. Does that sound right to people in the room? Yeah, that, that sounds reasonable for sure. Okay. okay. Quick clarifying Quickly. question is the intent to do that in lieu of resource identifier or in addition to? What, what is your intent for this next, next stab? Um, I would put the resource identifier in the metadata at that point. But okay. um, you're, okay, so you're this free to convince us otherwise. I'm, I was just wondering what the editor's intent was for this next thing. Thank that, you. That's what I would do because more yeah. is sometimes more. Mike, thank you. And uh, thank Aaron, you all. Aaron, thank you. Okay, Oliver, Daniel.
Um, yeah, hello everybody. I'm Oliver Thiabo and I'm going to talk about SD chart based verifiable credentials today together with Daniel Fett. Um, next one. Yeah. First of all, uh, <clears throat> a quick recap on SD chart based verifiable credentials. Um, so it defines a profile of SD chart um, for verifiable credentials, similar to an ID token that defines a profile um, of charts uh, in. And uh, the spec itself also defines data formats, uh, media types uh, for variable probable credentials based on SD charts um, using JSON payloads. Um, so it's not RDF based, it doesn't use JSON LD. And on top of that, it defines uh, validation rules and processing rules for verifiers and holders of um, verifiable credentials based on SD charts. And it's also possible to use this with um, non disclosable, non selective disclosable um, charts um, too. Next. Um, and this is useful in the um, so-called issuer holder verifier model. Um, in the issuer holder verifier model, um, verifiable credentials, which are issuers signed at the stations that contain claims about the subject, uh, which are also optionally bound to a key, so they can be um, you know, like, uh, sent amongst these um, participants. So the issuer, for example, issues a credential for a driver's license um, to the holder, and the holder can then present the driver's license to verifiers, and the holder can optionally approve um, this key binding I was talking about. And there's also a status provider where you can optionally check the, the status of a credential. Um, next one, please. Um, the spec uh, was adopted at the last um, IETF meeting in San Francisco, and uh, um, then we published um, version zero and uh, recently published version one. And now I want to talk about the, uh, the updates. Um, next one, please. So what's new? <laughs> what's new in version one? Um, so we have uh, renamed, uh, so based on, so everything was basically discussed on, on GitHub. Uh, so if you want to see why we decided certain things, please go to um, GitHub and check that out. And also we encourage to also participate in the discussion. Um, so first of all, the type identifier. So it's a uh, we, we defined new rules for the type identifier um, so for collision resistant names. Um, um, we renamed the type claim uh, to VCT, verifiable credential type. We had a lot of bike shedding discussion, and uh, then we um, removed some duplicated and inconsistent requirements uh, on key uh, key binding charts, um, which are inconsistent with the SD chart spec, which also you know advanced. Uh, since uh, last time we um, updated this spec. And uh, then we also defined uh, rules um, for obtaining the um, issuer verification key, which is important for verifiers. Uh, and then there was obviously also some uh, editorial changes and we fixed, we fixed also references. Um, next one. Um, so this is a summary. So this is the latest thinking of um, a verifier um, should obtain um, the verification key of an issuer signed chart. So basically, how does the verifier verify the signature of a verifiable credential? Um, so there are different mechanisms um, based on what we saw um, that the community has as requirements. So the first one was um, uh, using um, the X5 uh, star headers um, in a JWT. So there's like, you know, X5C, X5T, X5T, um, uh, S256, and so on. So there's a few of them. And they all correspond to X509 certificates and more specifically to a leaf certificate at the end of the chain. So if the verifier encounters one of those headers, then the expectation is that the, head, uh, the verifier would um, uh, try to match the ISS value um, against the DNS name or uniform resource identifier uh, value in, a, in the sun, sun extension, so the subject alternative name extension of the uh, leave certificate of the X509 certificate. And then get the verification key from there and verify the issue assigned short. If um, the ISS value is a HTTPS URL, um, then the verification key um, uh, should be obtained from the well-known short issuer metadata, which um, contains a JWKS or JWKS URI, um, uh, yeah, JWKS uh, set, uh, set of um, JWKs. <laughs> Public keys, um, and if if the ISS value is a DIT, then you should do um, DIT resolution and uh, also optionally use the KID 
um, to further locate the uh, public key in the DIT document. Um, the key ID can be an absolute or relative DIT URL. And then ecosystems can also um, add the additional rules um, as long as they don't contradict with the rules that we uh, just uh, discussed. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. So, and uh, now, um, Daniel. Thank you. Um, yeah, we got a couple of points open for discussion, and we have 40 minutes left, so that's great. Um, so, first things first. Um, Oliver um, already mentioned that there's this, there used to be the type claim, which is now called Verifiable Credential Type VCT. And um, a type claim is, um, or just calling something type is always great because everybody has an idea uh, what to put into the type, but it's not necessarily the same idea for everybody. Um, and it's very easy in the spec to kind of weasel out of this and to say, this is the type of the credential. But the question is, what does it actually mean? Um, so instead of weaseling out, we thought that maybe it would be a good idea to actually define what it means. So define the concept of a credential type um, for sd.vc. So this is all scope to sd.vc. We're not going to define um, anything for other credential formats, right? So um, sorry, uh, there are some questions in the chat there. Um, Brian, uh, Richard, are they a clarifying question? Or some okay you wanna wait go ahead brian uh, oliver's head is right in front of the camera <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> all right the, that's not what that wasn't the question right that wasn't the question but it was a, a comment from us viewers at home um my actual question was do we really really need to bring dids into this in a normative way where the credential type? No, it was on, on the prior slide. This one? Dids as a, a method. I think that should be removed and deferred to the ecosystems can define Well, we need to define it somewhere, I guess. No, we don't. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, maybe. Nobody really needs dids, right? Um, I, I also have some next five or nine comments here, but we, I'm happy to save that until later if you want to organize it that way. So okay. the thing is, I think for a credential format, we should define this. Uh, we're not doing this in SD drop; we're doing it in SD drop VC, um, and it is a property of a credential that you can verify it. And I think in SD drop VC, we should talk about the mechanisms that are suitable to, to do that. Um, if we agree that we that, like this should be put into a separate spec and uh, pulled out and make, make more generic, I, I think that's fine. Um, but right now, um, for example, when we use jots for, for ID tokens, um, we have a defined way to find the issuer key, but we don't have for the SD VCs. Yeah, we have we have one way there, and I think it's appropriate to specify some ways here. I'm I'm pushing back on specifically on using dids as a normative piece, and that could be deferred. Get rid of that point and just roll it up under ecosystems can define their own rules. Yeah, plus yeah, one saying, uh, saying use dids is like saying use a protocol. Well, there that's are already a, like yeah. two hundred of them. We, we can take this offline or yeah. no hope off. of interrupt. Yeah. Yeah, let, let's take this offline then. Okay. On GitHub? Or mailing list, list or, or GitHub, yeah. Okay. Um so coming back to the credential type. Um there's certainly um um a set of metadata that is usually associated with credentials. Um and we've seen some of that metadata pop up in other places. Um, for example, in the OpenID for Verifiable Credential Issuance Protocol, um, where it shows up in the issuer metadata, but it's not really issuer metadata. It's really about the credential. So I think this should be associated with a credential type. And this can be, um, and this is, this is really, um, really early. So these are just the initial thoughts that we had on this topic, right? Um, Something like display information about the credential. That's something that 
other credential formats already defined. Um, it starts with a background color uh, to display it in your wallet, but it can also be other information as well. Um, information about the claims, um, for example, also how the claims are displayed, right? So if it's uh, if a claim is called given name, uh, what does that translate to in French? Um, type information um, in the sense of what can a wallet expect in a, as the value um, of a claim, of course, again, to display it in the wallet. Um, and status information about the claim. So is it self-attested? Is it um, Has it been verified? Um, maybe there are other options as well. So uh, where does that claim come from, um, essentially? Um, and also the whole thing with, uh, with binding the credential, um, we already have to find an SD draw to key binding, but also claims-based binding is a um, big topic. So um, using claims in the credential to um, maybe with another credential to check that they match and then um, we can trust that those belong together or something like that. Um, maybe it would be useful to encode some of that information. And this is really early, this has just some ideas, but um, uh, there, there's a set of metadata and um, this to, having this information would help, um, especially wallets to handle their credentials because they uh, usually don't know a lot about the credentials. They get the credentials, they send them somewhere else, but um, yeah. Um, verifies as well, um, verifies, um, especially verifier developers would uh, be interested in learning what the type looks like, so what data fields can be there and so on. Um, yeah, so um, having a credential type, I think is a very useful thing if we associate some metadata with it. Next slide, please. Um, we are um, at the very beginning of this. So I think what we should do is we should agree on an initial set of data, which can be very small. Um, then think about how we can distribute that data. Um, two options could be to have a registry for the data. If um, people prefer IANA registries, they, can, they could put the data in there and then get a nice uh, short name for the credential type. Um, credential types could also be URLs so that we can make the metadata discoverable via that well-known URL. I um, think that would be nice as well. And um, specifically for um, SDJOT, uh, so, and we want to do this, as I said, specifically for SDJOT VC. We're not going to define credential types for all credentials, right? So this would be, um, yeah, very specific. And um, then of course, also try to um, pull stuff out of other specs where I think doesn't really belong. So the VCI spec and a high assurance profile um, for OpenID for VC to, um, so there are some duplications there. So to remove as much as we can from there that belongs into the credential type metadata. Next slide, please. This is a completely made up example of what this could look like. Um, so um, just, just to give you a very rough impression, um, so for example, the VCT, which of course would be the identifier for the uh, credential type um, could be in this document. Then the um, display information, uh, which starts with some information about the credential itself, um, including the logo, background color, and so on. Um, and then there could be information about the various claims. For example, um, there could be a JSON pointer pointing to the claims in the credential and then providing some display information, like a translation for the name of the claim and the status of the claim, whatever that exactly would be, right? Um, just to give you an idea, something to think about. Um, I'd like to invite you to participate in that discussion. Um, right now it's on GitHub, but we certainly want to bring this to the list um, to um, have, a, like, have more people participate in this and um, yeah, um, probably the, the right time to bring it to the list is once we have, have um, a better, clearer idea of what data we want to put into this and then to discuss it there. Next slide, please. Um, different topic. Um, Oliver already mentioned that we have the JORT issuer metadata. Um, so the, the metadata, the JORT issuer metadata um, is 
where you can find essentially the key to verify if you use um, a URL to verify um, the credential. And right now it's called uh, JOT, it's, it's called issuer, meta, yeah, issuer metadata or JOT issuer, issuer yeah. metadata, yeah. Um, and that's very generic, um, but we're defining it in, the, uh, in our spec, SDJOT VC spec. So I'm not sure if that's appropriate to define a ve like this very generic sounding name in the very specific um, spec. So I think we should think about, and other people uh, seem to think so as well, um, coming up with a better name, a um, more precise name that um, scopes this to um, SDJOT credentials or SDJOT VC credentials specifically. Um, there's an issue on that on GitHub. Um, if you have a great idea, if you have a strong opinion on it, let us know. What else? Um, we need to uh, improve the examples that we have. Um, we also have some, uh, we have an open pull request on that. We need to, to work on that, provide better examples, uh, especially for the EIDAS um, to um, ARF examples. So the, the stuff that is, um, where, where SDJVC is actually going to be used um, as far as I know, um, and, and to provide useful examples to encode personal data uh, there. And um, yeah, some other topics that we need to uh, discuss as well, um, confidence and assurance levels, and also uh, how to bind the credentials. So then claim space binding. Um, yeah, so that's stuff that we want to add to the spec as well. Thank you very much. And we now can take questions. Thank you. Anybody has any? Question, comment? Richard. Rewinding all the way back to the issuer key discovery stuff. Um, I don't want to be the X509 nerd in the room, but- What is that? Um, I think the one- uh, you, you, you went past it. It's, yeah, there you go. Um, <clears throat> So I, I am totally sympathetic to wanting to have a non-live HTTP way of distributing issuer keys. Um, that is really salient to a bunch of use cases I care about. Um, you may run into some problems if uh, the only um, authorized key usages in the uh, X509 certificate are uh, TLS server authentication, as is very common with web PKI certificates. Um, which are the ones you'd probably be, uh, which are like the obvious ones that, that folks use. Now, if we're okay ignoring that, great. But you know, the, you, you may have some PKI nerds uh, complain about that as match. Yeah, thanks for the input. No, it's definitely not the intention. I think it's definitely valuable to have also support for even air gap root certificates, for example, in high assurance uh, environments. Uh, one, one other thing that occurred to me here. Um, here you seem to have kind of a, it, it makes a difference in the format of the credential, whether you use uh, X509 or HTTP based discovery. Um, it seems like you could maybe split the difference here and have the credential be invariance, just always have an issue URL there. If you had some other object that basically captured the JWK set from the issuer metadata and signed that, um, under under an X509 certificate that's anchored in some other PKI. Um, so um, you you would keep the the, J, the JOT format the same, um, but you you'd authenticate uh, the the key set. Um, and that, that was the design I um, gravitated a little bit more towards. I can send you some links to some stuff I wrote up about it in another context. Um, but that might be another alternative worth considering. Thank you. Okay. Um, Christina, you want to say something quickly? Yeah. Please do that quickly. Yeah, super quickly on DIDs. So yeah, I, I don't should don't think we should allow all two hundred methods. But if we're talking about like mandating HTTPS URL, for example, then I see Richard laughing. I saw you. Um, so <laughs> there are a bunch of people who implement DIT web right now who want to implement this specification. So if we completely take out DIT from here in mandate only HTTPS version, we're losing, you know, it quite some share of the market. So I'm just didn't want to, you know, let it sound like we're completely against it. So like just 
saying that having DITVAP, for example, would be like a really, really nice start. Um, and I see people shaking hands and like we should talk talk about it, but like, yeah. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. okay. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I think you're, you're after that. <laughs> Go ahead. OK, hey, I'm Paul. Um, I'm talking about um, a new draft that's hard to pronounce. Attestation-based client authentication. It's a bit hard. And uh, this is not Prague, as you can see. I hope this is the most current slide deck, but we'll see. OK. <laughs> Go to the next one, and uh, uh, Tobias was on there, so I'm doing this together with uh, Tobias Looker. Uh, I'm not sure if he's on online participating as well. Um, okay, so um, let's get started. The motivation of this um, is mostly uh, coming from IDAS. We want to um, Tobias is online by secure now. government credential issuance, so we need high assurances there. Um, and we want to do this with the VC ecosystem. OpenID for VCI is um, probably the protocol how we're going to do that. And we looked into the ecosystem, and we saw that not a lot of people care about the security of the wallet. So we want to, to make sure that the issuer can be sure that he's talking to the genuine, legitimate wallet, and that he can bind his uh, issued credentials to hardware-bound keys because there's lots of regulations that you can mostly only apply if you have very high assurances and mostly at some point you need some kind of hardware binding to this. Um, and yeah, and the question was how can we integrate this um, in yeah uh, things like OpenID and also like generalize them this concept uh, to our auth. Next slide. So this is. Basically, the solution it's, uh, it, ex it fits into the into the framework for client authentication, um, and there is some debate going on if this should be a client authentication or not. Maybe can keep this to the end. Um, and the idea is that the client instance. It's very hard to say whether this, from original OAuth terms, is a public client or not. Um, that's also a discussion. But it's going to be like a web wallet or like a native app wallet in the cases that we have in mind. Just one, one comment. Don't point there because All people right. are re remote and the, you, you talk to okay. what, what you're trying to say. Yeah, <laughs> great. Uh, and so we think that there's like a, a client instance. So a client instance is one particular device probably um, that uh, the issuer or the authorization server in all terms went to issue something to. And um, so the idea behind this is the client instance in step one here generates a key that he has under control. And in some way that is not part of the standard in step two, it requests an attestation, a client attestation from its backend. And um, it, can you, it can make use of any platform specific attestations. We don't want to specify this because this is probably very volatile and not uh, um, keep the same over, um, over the years. And then the client backend can validate all these platform specific attestations and generate um, a client attestation, which is bound to the key that we generated in step one. And it will send back the client attestation. And then the client instance can use this, generate a proof of possession with the key that it has, specifically for this authorization server, and then can use it in a token request or uh, at the par endpoint. Um, and uh, send this client attestation and the proof of possession, and then the authorization server can make sure all this really belongs um, to, this, to this client, uh, and this is bound to this client instance. And it can continue from there, probably uh, also using uh, a DPOP. Um, um, yeah, so that's uh, the basic idea. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, I think we covered all of this. Let's jump to the next one. Uh, this is something that like, how it could 
look in um, uh, a mobile wallet a setup. So the key that is being used is supposed to come from a secure element, TPM, secure enclave, whatever you call all of these things. And it should be opaque to the authorization server or the issuer, which kind of key thingy the client is using. So the idea is that this client instance, uh, that the client attestation that gets back at step four looks the same no matter what hardware underlying or which platform this client instance is using um, because the authorization server doesn't really care probably about this. He just wants to make sure, and we want to keep this like uh, in like a very, yeah, thin layer of interoperability in that way. Next slide, please. This is a slide from Tobias. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is how it would look like at the token request. Um, we have this client assertion uh, type, which is called jet client attestation here. And then the client assertion is uh, basically two uh, JSON web tokens. The first JSON web token is the client attestation that we received from our client backend. And, and this is something that the authorization server can verify and then look up against a trust list or an, a federation and, and see, well, this is a world that I, or this is a client that I trust. And then we have the tilde that's very uh, on vogue. And we have the client attestation proof of possession jot um, behind that. And that is a proof of possession similar to how a key binding jot works in, uh, in SD jot um, where we yeah, use the key that is signed in the client attestation and we use it for specific audience and nonce uh, from the authorization server. Next slide. On. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, there's the new assertion type and then the next slide probably, yes, these are the two uh, jots that are concatenated by the tilde. Next slide. Um, this is again another um, thing, how like the whole thing looks like. Uh, so it's two jots combined with the tilde. Um, and this is how a client attestation um, could look like. Um, it is a jot. Um, uh, the important parts, I just asked the issuer, that's our client backend, um, and then the sub equals to the client ID that's going to be used in the auth flow. Um, the yeah, time validity information can be used by the client backend also to signal some form of like how long should you trust the thing. This is belonging then later to the discussions of assurance levels. Um, and in the end, we have the confirmation claim. That's the key, the client instance key that's being used um, for the proof of possession. Next slide. So yeah, the use case I think I mostly talked about, we can well, use it for any OAuth flow with client authentication. And uh, in particular, we want to use it for OpenID for verifiable credentials uh, issuance. Um, uh, especially in the IDAS context. Next slide. Yeah, you have a few people in the queue. Do you want to take uh, questions now, or do you want to wait? As it, has anyone urgent questions? No. no. Okay, yeah. okay. Keep going. Okay. Then uh, next slide. Let's just. Yeah. So uh, what happened? So this draft was presented in San Francisco at last, last ITF, and it was uh, adopted um, uh, very shortly afterwards on the mailing list. Uh, thanks for that, for all the support. And since then, um, there has been a little progress, um, which is summarized here. Um, the introduction was a, a little bit uh, confusing, and we kind of simplify that, making less assumptions um, about the, the, yeah, the circumstances around this. Uh, making it more OAuth generalized. Um, there is a big discussion um, around replay attack detection. So how can we make sure that this client attestation proof of possession jot um, is not being replayed? Um, there's three ma major things that we could use here, or like two. Either we use like jot IDs and the authorization sh server has to keep track of those or we use uh, nonces that are either implicit or explicit. Um, 
we added some guidance around this, and there is like endless issues in various repos uh, on how we want to do that because there's a lot of people that actually want to use this um, draft. Um, and we haven't particularly decided what is the best way. We think that jot ID is kind of our fallback mechanisms, but almost all people agreed that we should use nonces. And the question is, how do we get the nonce from the authorization server to the client? Uh, particular important, uh, like particular troublesome, how do we do it at the par endpoint? Because at par, the client makes the first um, request uh, to the authorization server, so we don't have any chance there uh, to do that. And the question there is, do we have a nonce endpoint that we want to create or um, do we have an additional round trip or what do we do? Um, we have, um, yeah, we have generalized um, saying that this is not only applicable to the token endpoint, but also like par endpoint. Uh, we did some clarifications on how to use this with refresh tokens, but there's also ongoing discussions how to do this with refresh tokens. And we fixed some like uh, typos and things that were like obviously wrong in the text, uh, but meant otherwise. And we have some examples how this matches to IDAS, uh, how we expect this to, to do. And last slide is, uh, yeah, what are we working on? Um, as this should be used for wallet attestation, um, we kind of, or like I envision something that we have an um, authenticator assurance level so that the client back and sees all these attestations that we get and he can analyze this and say, well, to a certain degree, you can achieve this level of assurance in a particular trust framework because the authorization server doesn't really care which key type is used and what user authentication mechanism with how many pin digits. He just wants to know, is this applicable to my use case or not? So in the end, we want the client backend or we might call it attestation service summarizes or analyzes all the things that he has seen in the client authentications as well. You can do substantial or high. Um, we're renaming the client backend to client attester or client attestation service because uh, might be different entities. Um, we want to register uh, media types and uh, so therefore JUT types. And um, I've already covered the discussion on the nonce mechanism. I think this is a big ongoing thing. And then uh, some people want to use this mechanism um, also in the verification of, uh, in the presentation of credentials, so in open for vp uh, That's a big discussion if we actually want this. It wouldn't work right now because it's a client authentication method and an open ID for vp uh, it's the other way around. And then uh, the ongoing discussion on refresh tokens. OK, so we have six minutes and seven people in the queue. So please, very briefly. Hi, Justin Richer. I have a lot of concerns, but I'm not going to go through all of them right now because we're short on time. One of the first things, though, that uh, that I notice is that looking into this, you're going and talking to the authorization server, getting something that is, uh, you know, attested to be part of a key, handing that back to the client for the client to just use going forward. This smells a lot like dynamic client registration. Um, is there a reason that it's not? Is that a deliberate choice? Because for me specifically, the use of client attestation uh, is directly applicable to other dynamic registration type of use cases uh, outside of uh, client authentication to the token endpoint and whatnot. Well, yeah, first of all, I would want to say that like I'm not an OAuth expert. I'm like pretty new to OAuth and I know that there's, I think there's some overlap to dynamic client registration. And I think that's probably also what Aaron wants to say. Um, so, yeah, I don't have a perfect answer. Tobias probably wants to say something to this. Yeah, feel, yeah. feel free to join up, Tobias. Yeah. Yeah. So I I just wanted to say the 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 party that the um client is obtaining the attestation from Justin isn't the authorization server. It's a uh, we call it the client backend right now, but we're actually yes. going to change it to the the client. Oh no, I, I I understand that, but the client attester needs to have some sort of relationship with the AS in order for the key to be trusted upon attestation, and that yes. part when you look at it from a distance feels more like that's part of the registration step. That's what I was saying. 
So uh, yeah, I'm absolutely. just saying that this there might be a larger. There might there. be a trust list behind that where the authorization server might look up that client ID and what that actually means, or there might be a federation behind it. That's for yeah, now yeah. not in scope, but. Right, I, and I'm saying that there might be a larger mechanism, so. Thanks. Right, yeah, so to, to be Thanks, very yes. clear though, it's we're not trying to, uh, the way that the client would identify itself to the authorization server is, is not for consideration in this draft per se, it's, it's more a client authentication mechanism, but um, understand that there is overlap there. Okay, uh, Philip, please keep it short, guys. Absolutely, so no. I uh, do think this should be or could be explored to be a DCR mechanism as well, uh, maybe be the DCR mechanism, but that's not why I came to the mic. Um, there was a use case slide uh, which uh, started with something like this could potentially be used for other of two endpoints or mechanisms that use client uh, authentication. Um, and I think I want to definitely strike the potentially. Um, this has to work as a general mechanism if it's going to be if, if it's going to be uh, brought further on. And on your very early slides, um, exactly the point that um, that Justin was making. The relationship between the key that is used by the um, AS to verify the attestation, um, that is something that needs to be explicitly, at least for whatever default um, and generic way of operation of this mechanism, needs to be specified with metadata or uh, the client's uh, pre-registration, which could be done with DCR, as it's the jokes URI or something so that the uh, authorization server knows where to go and get the key. Thanks, Philip. Aaron. Hi, Aaron Parecki, Okta. I'll try to keep this quick. One, thank you for doing this so I don't have to. <laughs> Two, um, uh, client attestation is a different problem than authentication, client authentication, and they are both important. And I would like to be able to do both all of the time. What I mean by that is anytime that the client talks to the AS, we currently have a slot for client authentication. Uh, we now also have a slot for token binding using DPOP. And there is another input to that, which would be client attestation. And I would, in fact, like to be able to send all three of those at a time. So as was previously said, um, using attestation at all of the existing endpoints in OAuth would be very useful, including dynamic client registration, the token endpoint for all kinds of things that happen at the token endpoint, the par endpoint, et cetera, et cetera. So this is great, but it shouldn't take up the client authentication slot that we already have. It should be in addition to that. Thanks, Aaron. Christina. Not sure I agree with that, but somewhat related. Um, I agree we, we want to use it regardless. And so if you look at the JOT, JOT profile for client authentication and authorization grants, RFC already existing in this working group, Like I would like to be able to use, I look at this draft as more like sender constraint JOT profile for client authentication and authorization grants, potentially. And where I'm going is, we have a use case where um, we would like to use this. If you look at this sender constraint JOI as a grant, um, use it as a grant type um, to be able to get um, access token. I don't, have to, I don't think I have time to explain more, but yeah, I would like this to be discussed. Thanks, Christina. George? And I'll, I'll just say ditto to what Aaron said. There's many, many places we could use this, and attestation is quite different from authentication. I saw Ben joined. Do you have a quick comment? Go ahead. Very quick comment, um, just not for discussion, but just to consider. Um, I'm Ben Buchs. I work on Thunderbird. And we connect to mail servers. And uh, case in, uh, company, I, I want to use Thunderbird. My company uses Microsoft Exchange of 365. I have to go through OAuth. Um, what, how can this be, how can this not be app used to block Thunderbird from connecting to Office 365 and Microsoft saying, no, we only support our apps and everybody else go away. And that point we lost access to mail. Okay. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Aaron. Can you give me slide control? Uh, let me see. How can I do that? Where is that? This is a new. A new... Yeah. 
There we go. Yes, great. Yeah. And timer. Thank you. OK, hi. I'm Aaron Parecki from Okta. Um, OAuth 2 for browser-based apps. This has been in the works for a while now, um, and I wanted to give an update on the status of it after uh, the last time we talked about it in San Francisco. Um, the short version of what this is, is this is recommendations for people who are building OAuth applications, clients, that they run in a browser environment. Um, typically, that means a single page app, browser-based app, JavaScript app, whatever you want to call it. Um, however, it may it does include the case of a JavaScript app that has its own backend component that's in scope. Um, first, I want to give a huge shout out to Felipe for stepping up as a co-author of the draft. Felipe has put in a ton of work to do a, a big overhaul of how this draft has been presented. Um, he is remote, so um, he's here today. If I say anything wrong, I hope he will speak up because um, I wanted to give a summary of what uh, of what those changes are. So the um, fundamentally nothing has changed in terms of like the recommendations and the the document itself. However, it is now much much more readable and much easier to find things within the document. The big restructuring uh, was starting with the threat model of what we're talking about, rather than jumping into the recommendations, um, and then. Once we have that threat model laid out, uh, the, the most of the document talks about kind of three main architectures of applications, playing pure JS apps, apps that get tokens from a backend but then use them directly, or apps that um, go route everything through a backend component. So now each of those sections, as they talk about the uh, the, the properties of each of those architectures, now are able to reference the threat model and say, this one solves this, this does not solve this, things like that. I have a couple of examples we'll actually look at in here. Um, for example, this is the, uh, from the table of contents, this is the, the main new section in the draft that talks very explicitly about the types of attacks that we are worried about and considering and uh, trying to protect against. Previously, these some of these were in here. Um, I think actually they were all in the draft, but they were kind of hard to find and they weren't able to be pointed at. So this is now a great list that goes into detail about the actual attacks that we are uh, caring about. And then when we get into, for example, the BFF pattern, where um, this is the, the pattern where the JavaScript app um, doesn't ever see the tokens because everything the JavaScript app does, it talks to its own backend, then bundles the token along to go make an API request. We're able to now say, uh, these are the attack vectors that are still possible with this architecture, and these ones are solved. Uh, so you might notice that there are um, there is one in here, which is turns out as good as we can do in JavaScript. Um, whereas some of the other back end, the other uh, patterns, like the pattern where the JavaScript client goes first to its own backend to grab tokens, but then goes and uses them, but it still has to store them. Now we care about things like token theft because the tokens in the browser, um, persistent token theft, which is a set variation on that, and that results in you know these these consequences. Um, and then of course the 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 worst one here, which is vulnerable to you know four of these different kinds of attacks, is when it's a pure JS client. And I feel like this does a much better job of really explaining the situation of uh, how how these different architectures actually affect the security outcomes of building these clients. Um, so that's the big update. Again, like there's nothing, there's not a lot of like new, there's no changes to the functionality of the recommendations because again, this was meant to capture the security considerations of these kinds of clients, but please do still review the changes. Um, and I'm hoping that this is like the home stretch here because I think this was a huge, huge, uh, very, very good rewrite of how this information was presented. That's it? That's, that's it, so okay. yeah. First, um, thank you, um, Aaron and Felipe. Yeah, I know you put lots of effort into this and, and it's great work. We appreciate all the hard work that you've put into this. Um, so do you, do you feel that we are ready for work group last call or? What's... I um, I do feel like we're ready. However, I realize that 
probably not everybody has actually read this yet. Right. Um, but I do feel like it's ready. So okay. I don't so, know how to balance okay. those two. So I, I would like to hear, uh, Justin is in, in the queue and, and people, if what do you think? Have you reviewed the document, the changes? Go ahead. Hi, Justin Richard. I have not yet read the new version of the document. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's actually been a minute. Um, so my, my only real question is that, you know, this has been progressing for a while and I agree it's, it's great and it's important work. My only real question is, uh, does this have considerations for things like uh, storage of uh, credentials that are bound to tokens, depop keys and the like, uh, and storage of those, or is it uh, just storage of access tokens? Or is that looped under secrets there no there's um it does talk of i i i'm pretty sure there's a section that talks about mm -hmm. the web crypto api in javascript and how it does not guarantee that that private key is actually hardware bound right that it can still be extracted from the file system but cannot be extracted from the javascript attacker um if I remember correctly, there's a whole section about Depop in the draft. Gotcha. Okay. Like I said, I, I haven't read the new version of it. The last version I read was pre-Depop, so yeah. it's it's been yeah. a minute. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Neil? Hi, it's Neil. Again, I'm, mine was pretty similar. I'm, I was just trying to find the Depop references in here, and it wasn't clear to me from this, and I have only scanned it a bit for the Depop references, how you were meant to... Um, bind it to the browser so that you, know, you definitely can extract it. I think it'd be good to actually talk a bit more about that in here if you want people to use that. Okay. Any other questions, comments? And Felipe, feel free to join and, and if you want to say any, anything here. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I have the document open here. So there's a section that briefly explains how you can use Depop to um, well, combined with the Web Crypto API to use a non-extractable key uh, to create your Depop proofs. Um, however, there's the second paragraph in the section is a side note that says like, yeah, but even with Depop enabled, it doesn't really solve the problem um, because the attacker is very likely to be able to um, abuse tokens anyway uh, because they can use their own secrets to set up Depop. Um, so it's, to be honest, it's fairly limited what's in there. It, it gives the necessary information and pointers on how to do it. And then I, it kind of defers the, the, the actual details to, uh, to what follows from Depop itself. OK, so can we go ahead? Gonna, I, I was just going to add to that. that. Um, I just pulled it up. The, the header in the document is called Sender Constrained Tokens, not called Depop. However, it talks about Depop. But again, like Felipe just said, the, the problem is that it um, Maybe this is maybe this is a, a a sign that this should get moved up into a higher up because it does solve some of the attacks and it does not solve other ones. So just like the other architectures, like it has some of these properties where these things are solved and these things are not, and it is still worth knowing that. Um, so that I can I can I can understand the argument for for wanting to bubble that up higher than uh, the security considerations section where it's in. Okay. Can, can I? Oh, go ahead, Justin. Uh, I would second that um, because uh, the storage of keys and stuff like that is effectively another type of deployment pattern, more so than a security consideration, I would argue. But I, I think that's a good idea to do. Can I get a few volunteers to review the latest version of the document? Philip, Justin? Anybody else? One more, please. OK, you have two to, to people to review it. And um, let, let's, let's see what, what happens after that. Maybe we can, if, if we feel comfortable after that, we can make, make a work group last call, OK? OK. Let's, let's. Philip. Yeah, Justin, if you, if you review the document, um, let me know if, if you still think deep up it's, it's like a separate pattern because um, it, it kind of fits nicely into the different patterns we have. And I'm not sure it should be listed as a completely separate section. But um, let me know once you've read, read the draft and the patterns and, and dimensions of Depop that are in there. And we'll, we'll take it from there. 
Yeah, to be clear, it's not that depop is a separate pattern. It's that the uh, sort of the nature and storage of uh, associated secrets would be the separation of the pattern. So yeah, it, so it's, it's it's tough because like you can, can use cross depop cut. with all three existing exactly, patterns. Yes. So it's not like a separate thing. But the using depop does give you some properties that you don't get by not using depop, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not the silver bullet that solves everything. So like it absolutely I don't know isn't. exactly where to slot it in there because it's more than a it's more than a security consideration, but it's not a full separate pattern. So instead of a pattern, it might just be a different sender constraint tokens might just be a, its own section. Maybe maybe we just move it up before the security considerations in its own section and then just give it its own subheaders. Yeah, like something like that. That yeah. that to me feels feels like that. I I will I will read through the doc and you know if that still makes sense after doing that, then um, then that'll be in the review. Awesome. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. OK, perfect. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Uh, thanks again. You, you great job, guys, on, on this document. Appreciate it. OK. Uh, Peter. Here we go. Okay, do I have control? Yeah, I can. And you control. Find the first. Come on. You, you get going, and I'll, I'll give you the control now later. Uh, okay. You start. Yeah. Um, um, Peter Kasselman, I uh, can talk about the latest on the cross device flow uh, BCP that we've been working on. And today, I'm happy to have both Philip and, uh, and Daniel in the room with us. Um, still waiting on control. Yeah, there you go. All right. So um, this is customary, a picture of Prague as imagined by an AI. It's not bad, actually. <laughs> um, I do now actually have real pictures of it as well. But um, yeah. <laughs> For those who don't, th there's, there's been some reaction about the incorrectness and, uh, of the, uh, the picture. Um, OK, so why are we here? Uh, not quite in the cosmic sense, but what is it that brought us to this? Um, I'll also talk a little bit about where we are right now and, and where we need to go next. OK, so why are we here? Um, wind back uh, 12, 18 months. Uh, one of the things that we started seeing is a considerable number of attacks that's really focused on extracting uh, tokens, token theft. And there's sort of several entry points for that. And one of the things that became apparent is that one of the big entry points is around social engineering type attacks against uh, cross device flows, as an example. And this is a way for people to get unsolicited, uh, unauthorized access. Um, and these attacks, uh, really how they work is they end up exploiting this idea that you know, you're going to initiate a flow on one device, you're going to want to transfer that to another device, usually by scanning a QR code. Um, and essentially what happens is there's this unauthenticated channel that gets exploited by the attacker. And so what attackers do is they would initiate a flow and then they would take this QR code and change the context in which they present it to the user. And uh, a user would scan that and be fully convinced that they are doing something completely normal, legitimate, and grant authorization. And so simple example, uh, you might get a message that says, um, oh, you know, uh, your SharePoint site is about to be deleted. Please scan this QR code and authenticate. And of course, you don't want your SharePoint site to be deleted, so you go and you scan this and you grant access and authorization to the person who actually initiated the, uh, this flow to start with. Uh, and so this is particularly insidious because it, it's actually sort of really even bypassing multi-factor authentication. 
uh, doesn't matter how many layers of authentication you add, you've tricked the user or you've convinced the user to say yes. And all of this because you have this unauthenticated channel between the initiating uh, device and the uh, authorization device or the consumption devices we now use. So we started looking at this. Um, I think one of the things that we're trying to do is putting some pragmatic mitigations uh, in place, also looking at alternatives and really encouraging people to adopt uh, protocols that have better protection. Uh, if you need to have a cross-device authentication or authorization flow, uh, please use something like FIDO or PASCII with uh, authorization code grant. Please don't use things like device authorization grant if you can avoid it. Um, we've also started looking at uh, doing some of the what we call foundational underpinnings. So Daniel and uh, also researchers from uh, 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 University of Stuttgart and other places have started looking at doing some research about, uh, you know, is there things that we can discover about these attacks or are there some of these mitigations that's particularly uh, effective and uh, uh, to see if we can actually just improve the situation that we're facing. So that's the sort of the problem, the approach that we're taking. Uh, so where are we in Prague? But more specifically, uh, this is kind of the, the sort of winding road that we've been on. Uh, since the last time we spoke in San Francisco, uh, we did also present this work at the at OSW, the OAuth Security Workshop. And we got some really fantastic feedback uh, from a couple of uh, uh, folks that I think, uh, and I'll talk more about the impact of that, that's caused us to really sort of go back, rethink a little bit about how the, the document is structured, and actually we ended up adding another attack pattern as a result of that. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, today. And I also noticed that I made a mistake on that slide, slide, slide bug. Okay, so the BCP, there's a QR code. Anybody would like to scan the QR code? No, not today, um, but you can, it's perfectly safe promise. I'm slowly conditioning people to trust QR codes that I show them. Uh, <laughs> but by the time we're done, you'll all scan it and there will be a catch. Anyway, no, moving on. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so what's new? So one of the things that was pointed out at OSW from uh, Marco and, and Gita was that Although we describe uh, an attack, there's two attacks that we described um, that didn't fit the patterns or the abstraction that we were sort of reasoning over and presenting back to, um, uh, uh, to readers. Um, and so as a result of that, we sort of came to the conclusion that in fact, there's really, uh, you know, sort of thinking about Michael always says, right, he, the standard, uh, you know, it should, uh, it should contain everything that's needed, but no more. And so I think in the attempt to sort of how do we, to do the no more, we realized that we actually do need more. And uh, so we've, we've added this new cross-device session transfer pattern. And so this, uh, what makes this pattern interesting is that it's sort of almost the inverse. It's a, um, it's a flow that you start on the authorization device or on the device where you are already authorized, and then you transfer that session to a consumption device. So a typical example of that is you want to join your mobile phone to a network. So you go to your PC, you log in, you authenticate, you obtain a QR code, you scan the QR code, and your phone uh, joins the network. Uh, application bootstrapping is another one. You're logged into your email account. Uh, you want to transfer that session to your mobile phone, or you want to bootstrap that session on your mobile phone generate a QR code, you scan it, and it shows up on your phone. Um, and so uh, these examples are in the document, but the, the flows was not properly described. And so we, we actually broke that out as, it's, as a new uh, pattern um, and also described the attack, which is really a cross-device session phishing attack. Uh, that The types of these attacks are very, um, again, sort of insidious type things that attackers would do. They would call somebody up, uh, claim to be from an IT support organization, and uh, ask them to send them, to initiate this flow, basically authorize the transfer of the session, and then send them the QR code. Um, and then once this, then the attacker can scan this QR code. And because the channel is unauthenticated, there's no controls, uh, the attacker can take over the session. Um, 
And I really special thanks to uh, Marco and, and Gida for uh, pointing this out and actually helping and contributing text to make this clearer in the in the document. So that that is new. Um, uh, a few other things that we added, so as we also described these new attacks, uh, there was also a new mitigation that goes with that, so good news, we described the attack better, uh, and it also, we also got the opportunity to add a, 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 a mitigation, uh, the request binding with out-of-band uh, out data. Um, we also broke out user education as its own segment. Uh, there's some research uh, that uh, some researchers at the University of Holloway pointed out to us, and uh, that was um, particularly helpful in uh, sort of you know, uh, showing the value of user education as a mitigation on its own. So we, we wanted to draw attention to that. Um, and then the final thing, I think there was a long sort of outstanding issue that Aaron raised around, we had one mitigation called the authenticated flow. And really the idea was that the, before either transferring a session or initiating a session, you would actually authentic or authorizing a session, you would log in on the consumption device and then initiate the flow. Um, and so um, we, we, uh, we found a new name for that uh, called authenticate then initiate. Uh, we also added two new exploits I'll talk about briefly. Uh, the first one, the fake help desk. And so in this flow, um, the attack that we've observed, uh, you know, somebody phones up a customer and says, oh, we spotted some um, illegal account activity. Somebody is trying to buy things that they shouldn't. Uh, we're, we're going to send you a list of uh, transactions, and you have to just decline them in your application. And so the attacker will then start off and buy an airline ticket and of course, you'd get a notification and you'd just say no, decline, and then they'll buy a TV set. And again, no, decline. And you sort of keep, and the, the attacker would keep doing this and build trust with the, um, uh, uh, with the, the person being targeted. And then at the end of it, they would say, well, now that we have declined all these transactions, what I need to do is move your account or move your money. Uh, I'm now going to initiate a transaction. Please approve this. And at that point, the person has, you know, it's sort of built up this trust, trust and now they, they end up in approving these, these attacks. So, so that's one that we added. And again, you know, the mitigations that we describe here will help uh, co-location, um, uh, uh, proximity, and so on. Um, the, the second one, consent request overload. So this is another one that uh, we've observed, um, essentially really sort of focusing on uh, uh, launching attacks at very inconvenient times at high volume. So two o'clock in the morning, suddenly, you know, as a at IT admin, uh, you're, you start getting requests to authorize uh, access to a system, and you're getting them once every 30 uh, seconds. Your phone keeps ringing or your, your phone keeps buzzing. And eventually, just to make it go away or by accident, somebody says yes, right, and they're in. And again, uh, things like rate limits, uh, proximity detection and so on uh, will help with these attacks as well. So we've added those as other forms in which these cross-device flows do get attacked. Um, we did discuss in IITF 117 the various should, recommend, and may, the, the normative text. So that was added in uh, after, the, after uh, we discussed that um, in San Francisco. Um, and then a couple of editorial, or in addition to sort of restructuring and adding this new um, session transfer um, flow, we did a fairly big editorial scrub. Um, we also decided to adopt the OpenID Foundation terminology used in SIBA. Uh, in part, well, first of all, it just, um, I think it gives us greater consistency, but it also made it a lot easier um, uh, to actually describe the attack. So thanks to folks who've worked on SIBA for having come up with that terminology so we could reuse it. And then just acknowledging uh, Marco, Gida, and Mariam for their contributions uh, in reviewing the spec as well. Okay, so that's kind of the set of things that's changed. The question now uh, for folks, where do we go next? What's outstanding? So I think at this point, there's a couple of open uh, issues, some of them perhaps more pressing than others or, or more uh, critical than others. I think one of the things that we're trying to figure out is whether we can do a better graphical representation of the diagrams. So I think, Daniel, you, you've 
uh, we're sort of uh, we're fighting the formatting monster to see if we can can get something uh, slightly better, but that's more in trying to convey uh, how these flows and attacks work. Um, I, I think there's also a question about for ISO MDL, is there a way to reference? Is there something that we should do there? And then finally, I think the sort of biggest piece of work that I think that's outstanding for us is updating the formal analysis section. Uh, and so uh, I think right now we're really just waiting on some of the research that's been done over the last 18 months to be published so that we can reference that. And hopefully that'll get done in December, Daniel. Yep, yep. Daniel says December. Uh, so I think that's uh, the outstanding work that we see. And um, so next steps for big things, right? Update the formal analysis section. And then I think the other question that we have here is, uh, at what point uh, would it be appropriate for us to go to either get review or working group last call on the updated document? It seems you, that you still have a few things to close. So let's let's see. So yeah, so so let's let's close those, and maybe next year, early next year, we can. Okay, that would be, makes sense. Yeah, it'd be great if. Yep. Uh, I'm, Perfectly happy with that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Having a few reviewers after you spin the next version with those new edits, that it sounds like uh, would be appropriate, and then we can see whether it's, it's ready for working group last call. Okay, excellent. So do we do that just on the mailing list when we have the next version ready, and we can we request for reviewers before yeah. we uh, issue? Do we have some reviewers call? right now? Do we say like yeah, early next year, January, February? You, uh, you have some, some time available to go through this document. It's not short, but uh, could be interesting. Tony. Yes. Um, just wondering Andy. why. Andy. Yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Just wondering why you would add a reference to the um, ISO document, the MDL. There's no cross flows here in MDL today. Uh, Daniel, do you want to take that one? Um, uh, microphone. Mic <laughs> I'm uh, not not quite sure what the exact uh, wording around that was, but um, the um, I think there's cross device presentation at some point, isn't there? The, no, no. It depends on in which document are you talking about? Twenty two. Jesus, as if I would okay. know all this. Numbers. I just would like some clarification. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, need some clarification on that. I mean, obviously, yeah, we need to get that right. Yeah. Okay. Hey, go ahead, Christina. Go ahead. So, officially, right now, presentation of ISO MDL using anything is prohibited the same device. You know, take it as a grain of salt because you can't really prohibit anything, really. Um, having said that, when we originally said that, hey, can we, in this cross-device document, also talk about this credentials and three-party model, I remember resistance in this group. I partially, it was Vittorio um, saying that, look, like, this cross-device DCP talks about cross-device grant of OAS. So, like, why are you bringing in this credentialing? So, I'm fine maybe talking about the license, not exactly against, but if we do that, we need to talk about this whole credentialing space in general. We can't just have this entire document focusing mainly on you know cross-device grant and then just add this throw in MDL. That just feels a bit out of place if you're just throwing only that part. I think the idea is in this cross-device BCP, we should not talk about um, really credentials, um, that's not the point here. Uh, but the, what we should point at is other places where cross-device flows are used, and that can be credential-based flows. Um, and they use the exact same patterns. So it's nothing new to this document. It's just a different context where it's used. And we should point that out so that people are aware of it. I think that's the, the whole point here. Right, and the issue should be called reference open ID for VP, cross-device grant rule. Yes. I think we do that. Yeah. I think we I think we reference VP already. Okay. Tony, did you volunteer to review the document? Did I hear that correctly? Like for the minutes, just 
Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Tony. And thanks, Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Do you want me to give you control or do you want me to drive? Uh, I don't mind control. Sure. Okay. You have a new no. app? Oh, no. Okay, well, I'll drive. <laughs> <laughs> if you yeah. want control. You... <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering how Peter was doing it. Okay, so. Um, it's magic. Yes. Um, so I'm Paul again, uh, talking about all status list, or let's say the title is not very clear. That's one of the open issues. Um, it's a revocation or status mechanism, and I'm doing this together uh, again with Tobias and uh, Christian, who is not affiliated to Carsten Bormann. Um, so what are we doing? Uh, we this is mostly adaptable to SDJobVC again. Um, we want um, um, a revocation mechanism to later say, well, we issued some tokens like JOTs or COTs, and we the, the issuer might have an update to this saying, well, this is not legit anymore, or have some other kind of status that he wants to communicate about this token after that he issued it. Um, so that's kind of the idea that we want to do. Next slide, please. Um, how should this um, status or revocation mechanism like work? What's like the, the circumstance, the, the requirements that should um, be achieved? It should uh, scale very much. Um, again, as this is um, particular uh, applicable to IDAS, or that's one of the use cases that we have in mind, uh, we want a decent level of privacy. Um, yeah, let's say it like that. Um, and uh, we want to support like um, uh, the formats uh, like uh, Cose, Jose based tokens or credentials. Uh, specifically, we want it to be like integrate very nicely into ISO and MDoc and SDJVC as these are. Uh, the candidates for EIDAS pits, and um, would also be nice to have some caching support, um, um, enabling yeah, either offline verifications and also like giving relying parties some information um, how long these are yeah, um, how long these should be cached these status lists. Okay, next slide. Uh, so what uh, like what we do and uh, to be to be all, like clear, this is not something that like we invented. Uh, this is leaning against uh, W3C status list 2021, but for a number of reasons, um, we thought it makes sense to um, bring this to an ITF a draft so that has several different properties. Um, we're seeing this as, well, the foundation is like a byte array a status list. Um, and each bit or like multiple bits within this byte array uh, correspond to a status of a specific token or credential. Um, and um, the, the issuer uh, encodes the statuses of like lots of lots of credentials into this byte array. and um, the particular status of a token then can be referenced by an index. Uh, so with the index, you can look up the um, correct bits that correspond to this particular token, and then you know what the status is. And this status list is then hosted by the issuer somewhere on an infrastructure. And um, so it can be um, read by relying parties. Um, and the trick here is that this status list then, um, depending on this, the statuses that you have in there, but we mostly think about revocation, we expect kind of low revocation rates. So this uh, byte array that we have has just a lot of zeros, probably. And uh, so it makes a lot of sense to compress this, um, for example, with gzip. Um, and then we uh, encode this uh, in the JSON 
uh, and the JSON Web Token case uh, with Base64. Um, and then the issuer assigns that and um, can put that up on wherever he wants to do. Um, Life, do you want to go now or at the end with a question? Um, so I actually wanted to make a comment about the scalability stuff, but we, I can. Yeah, let's keep it to the end. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Uh, so this is an example how this works. Uh, we have two terms here. This is a reference token. So this is like the original token that we want to convey a status about. Uh, so um, this is a regular JSON web token. Um, and we define a new a claim here that's called status. It has two members, two properties. Uh, one is called URI at the moment, and that points to uh, a URL uh, or URI where uh, this statusless token can be um, received from, and then IDX for the index, uh, where within this status list uh, you will have to look up. Next slide. This is how the status list looks like. Uh, it is a JSON web token in this case. Um, the issue is supposed to be uh, the same here. And then this has a status list um, claim. Um, and this has uh, two properties. The first one is bits that uh, signals like how many bits one status has. So in the easiest case, that's one. And we just have like a bit array and like one bit applies to one reference token, uh, but that could also be um, multiple bits depending on how many different statuses the issuer wants to communicate. Um, and then we have the list. This is the base64 encoded gzipped status list byte array. Um, and also it contains a, a subject, um, which is the URI, URI under which it uh, could have been um, or where it was hosted on for like offline use cases. And then on the left, we see a JSON web token. Well, you know how JSON web tokens look like. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is how it fits together, the status. So the URI points to the place where the status list is hosted. Um, we're going to deflate this uh, with gzip. Then we have this byte array and uh, the reference token has the index 5, so we look up the index 5, and then we see, oh, it's a 1. And the, the draft then creates a registry where we have the values for these different statuses. And 0 means valid, and 1 means invalid. Uh, so they know that this is um, probably a revoked a reference token. Next slide. Um, we edit, so yeah, maybe to. Um, after we discussed this, the, what was the like history of this draft, um, to rewind a little. Uh, this was also presented at ITF um, in San Francisco. Uh, there was a bit more discussion if this uh, fits into our auth or not. Um, also accompanying to this like general discussion if SDJVC and all these things belong to OAuth or maybe to SPICE. Uh, in the end, we settled down that uh, for now, we see that this is applicable to OAuth, and there was um, a request for adoption on the mailing list, uh, which was successful. But that just ended like very shortly before this ITF. Uh, so there wasn't uh, a lot um, done since then. Um, um, and some features that this also has, and one of these is, is new since uh, the last one, um, is that uh, we kind of define this like a, a very basic fetching protocol of HTTP get, like how um, a relying party would fetch this uh, status list token uh, from yeah from the issuer or the status list provider, and we advise to use um, HTTP mechanisms, cache control, uh, and also uh, the accept header. And to, to differentiate between the status list and also give information like when there is an update to be expected. Next slide. Yeah, this is, I think this is a, a relevant slide with, with probably what a lot of people are wondering, like what's, what's the size of this thing? Because like, wh why are we doing this in the end? Because uh, CRLs just scale very badly and uh, surprisingly the status list scale pretty well. Uh, you can see for the number of credentials that the issuer 
contains in a status list and the percentage of things that are revoked, um, like how big these numbers get. Um, um, yeah, and we expect, like, th I think the average revocation rates on the internet are around 1%, also depends on the lifetime of your tokens. Um, and yeah, these, these numbers, well, can give an indicator of, of what you can expect in terms of size. Next slide. Uh, what uh, has happened since last time? We got adopted. Um, we changed the title that um, got a lot of confusion or a lot of discussion. Uh, before this, it was called Jot Caught Status List. Um, then there was a discussion to rename this because maybe we don't want to be that particular on these, these formats. Um, and we renamed it now to all Auth the status list, um, but we might want to get rid of this OAuth and people say we want token status list, but I think it's on the next slide. Um, we defined this HTTP protocol, how to retrieve a status list. We registered some um, IANA um, media types. Uh, we add a lot, in, a lot to the privacy considerations because this is always a big uh, a topic of discussion here. And then uh, we renamed Verifiers to Relying Parties and um, yeah, gathered some feedback from early implementations. And what's um, on the next slide? This last slide, work in progress. Um, so um, there, what we want to do is provide an option for an unsigned status list. So right now, the status list is always a JSON web token or a Seaboard web token. Um, there might be use cases um, where it is nice to have a repudiation. And um, if we provide a status list over an HTTP endpoint, you can achieve this. And also, it might just make things easier if the uh, issue doesn't have to sign that all the time if he updates this. Uh, we're switching from gzip to zlab. That makes life uh, easier. We have the discussion on the draft title. If you have um, opinions on that, please um, say so. Um, we're drafting some design considerations for the introduction because we get a lot of feedback why doing things in that particular way and uh, to like get rid of all these questions we just want to put in the introduction why we made certain assumptions and certain design choices um, we're still missing the seaboard web token representations and uh, security and implementation considerations uh, we're continuing to test this uh, and, and do uh, implementations and um, there is a lot of discussion if uh, privacy can be um, made better. Um, yeah, there's, there's no good solution in, in sight, it seems. And um, also, like, yeah, we're comparing to the mechanisms of revocation that we have in the X509 world, um, trying to learn uh, from these things. OK, ready for questions here? Go ahead, Leif. All right. Um... I have a couple of comments. One of them is on the scalability requirements. I, I mean, some of the business cases we've seen in, in uh, a couple of the LSPs, are, I actually think your numbers are a little bit uh, conservative. And at least one of the use cases we're looking at possibly up to 20% revocation and at least two orders of mag magnitude more um, credentials in there. So we have to kind of, I have no idea how we're going to deal with that, quite frankly, right? The, um, but just to note that I think we can, it is a bit conservative, right? The, the numbers you, you're using. What I would, more on concretely, I would say that the the integration into the token in the in into the credential itself should really have some algorithm agility. Uh, right now, it's sort of you, you're directly dereferencing the, the the thing, and it has one m way of dealing with status lists. Right now. Some, as you know, some people that were playing around with accumulators, and at, well, one of these days, somebody might come up with a better way to represent data. Even though you're pretty close to the like the uh, Shamir, I don't know, the, the theoretical minimum, right? But still, you might actually improve the way you represent data, and we should be have a way to say, right, this is the status bag. Here's the status mechanism. And you know, with that, with that within that mechanism, in the context of that mechanism, you interpret the rest of the parameters so you can go and do whatever you need to do. And that would also might give us a way to represent stapling approaches 
in the same way, uh, which I think we're going to want to use. For instance, I could like ship along a verifiable credential together with a bag of privacy pass tokens uh, based on the status of, of that verifiable credential. And I would, the, the verifier would know essentially that somebody was actually verifying, the issue would know that somebody was verifying the, the DC without knowing who, who, who did so, right? So it's a, a significant improvement over, over um, classical OCSP stapling, right? Um, so I, I think there's stuff that, that we're going to develop here. And we just, I just want to make sure that we have space in the protocol to do so, right? Yeah. And I think I had one more, but I'll, I forgot about it. So yeah, <laughs> thanks. There you go. I, I agree to uh, um, uh, most things I've said. And particularly, we, had, we have a lot of discussions, for example, with Giuseppe already on like a similar approach for VCs or JSON web tokens in general with an like OCSP stapling like approach. Um, and it should somehow, there should be like a match to this so that we can use like the same, the same data formats that I used in the reference token. But I think like, like the OCSP like stapling approach doesn't, should not be in that specification. No. It can be like a sibling RFC that, right. that, that takes like these forms right. of, yeah. But I, what I was thinking more of is if, uh, someday Peter Altman comes back with this magical accumulator based approach, right? Then, yeah, we can stick it in the same. Yes. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, well, yeah. Well, that's on, the, on our path. Thanks. Justin. Hi, to contradict what Leif just said. Um, <laughs> so I would actually, with, uh, with using something like this for the reference that is inside the, the token, uh, I would actually rather prefer that be a, a single scalar value. Uh, as in a URL that tells me everything that I need to know in order to get this. Now we can, if it is just a status token list and an index into that, we can do that very easily with a URI fragment because that is... Yes, we did. Well, this, ca this question came up twice already and we yep. deliberately not did that because what people will do is just take this whole URL and then fetch this, mm -hmm. but that destroys all the privacy features because then the status list provider learns that you are interested in index five. Yeah. Right. I get so that, but you're not supposed to it's, send it's, a it's, fragment. It is so a recipe for that. failure in my opinion. Plus you didn't count, you didn't actually counter my argument. <laughs> no, it counters the argument because it would get rid of the spaces for the additional parameters for other types of ways to look things up. That's that, that was the counter. Any, so we anyway. think, yeah, we think that URI should not contain the index because mm -hmm. you should take the URI as is, take the status list, and then apply the index yourself. If the index is somehow in this, in the URI, then probably implementations will send the index to the status list provider and destroying the privacy. Yeah, totally get that. That said, uh, multi-field composed identifiers have a way of getting composed weirdly and stored wrongly in implementations when we actually have to go unroll and do this. Uh, case in point, see issuer and subject in OpenID Connect. OK, thanks, Justin. We have um, six people in the queue. We have seven minutes, so We're on please. a roll with this. Uh, hi, Aaron Precky, Okta. Um, I am going to be the annoying OAuth guy again and say um, there's a lot of applications of this in OAuth that does not involve any kind of VC or anything regarding wallets and that kind of stuff. Like, I would love to be able to use this for John access tokens, which is an OAuth spec, and say, have a way to revoke John access tokens, because we don't really have a good way to do that right now. And this solves a lot of that stuff. And um, we don't really have the privacy concerns that, uh, that come with this because of the relationship between the AS and the RS in that. but. Um, the the other thing that Justin mentioned about the like cramming all to one URL, um, the thing that's relevant to the John Access token argument is the cacheability of this. Like the whole point of this is that the RS could cache this for whatever lifetime is uh, determined at that URL and not be fetching it every time, so that you get the performance boost of actually using this kind of list, which is great. So um, I did a quick scan of the document. There is zero mention of the term Access token. So I feel like that should go into the draft somewhere um, and maybe reference the Jot access token spec and uh, as, a, as an application of it. Thanks, Aaron. Hannes. 
Can, sorry, can I just respond to that really quickly? Sure. Yeah, so Aaron, I think the, the, the current um, language, to be clear, we, we're trying to leave it um, abstractly as tokens, right? Reference tokens in general. So they can be identity assertions, they can be access tokens, but I agree with you, we could, we could do better in communicating that. Um, there's certainly not any opinion around what that token is and the purpose. I think there's also no mention of our public credentials in the spec. No, that, that, that's fair. I just, uh, because we have a John access token spec in OAuth and this is in OAuth, yeah. there should at least be yeah. a mention of it somewhere, somewhere in the document. Yeah, and I think, yeah. I think to your point, we could also consider profiling on top of the JWT access token profile, how you would actually put this mm -hmm. status information into a JWT, right? Okay. okay. Thank you. Next, Hannes. Yeah, Jihad, off. Um, I think you should reference the, the work in the W3C. Um, and funny enough, the W3C work itself doesn't mention the original work, uh, which you should also reference in, in all fairness, uh, which is the Let's Rework work. So this is, uh, I think, from a like, style point of view. Okay. The other thing is like you define two formats for, this, for, the, uh, for the status list. Um, and if you use a, a JSON-based format, you have this ba ugly base64 encoding. If you truly care about size, you would, as you also specify, just use the CBOR-based version. You wouldn't have to worry about this. Um, and I've been done with it. Yeah, that's a good question. Like we 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 know that like yeah, the JSON part isn't as um, yeah optimal for like the binary of the status list. We just think for like some use cases, maybe like your whole tech stack is just on JSON. Do you want to like implement then a Seaboard part like only for one particular thing that you have? So I think we want to keep both options open. You're on. Yeah, thank you, Hannes, for saying exactly what I was going to say <laughs> about uh, size and SIBO. I'm not a fan of SIBO, but this seems to be the one place where SIBO is clearly <laughs> The, be the better way, uh, and then to go on record, token status list, please. Yeah. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, are, are we, how to put it nicely, are we actually competing with uh, W3C on a solution for the same problem? Have we thought it through? Well, there's a number of reasons why we don't like status list 2021 and we thought that it makes sense to to start this endeavor um i think yeah if we want to go into the reasons i think it's mostly about json the rdf and then the question is if this is for oauth like nobody in oauth knows verified credentials do you want to parse verified credentials for your revocation mechanism i think json web token is just the mechanism that is mostly available to all implementations. So I think that's an easier approach uh, for a, like a better data container for a status list. Okay, we have two minutes and still three people. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jaron. Uh, George. So I guess for me, I was trying to skim this back real quick. Um, I think we need to describe in what contexts this is useful for what kinds of tokens, because there's many other ways to do revocation, right? You've got shared signals, you've got other things that can make a lot of sense. And so, and even the access tokens, if it's a short-lived access token, is status list really a super valuable way to address revocation? So I think some context in here about this solution is applicable under these conditions would be really helpful. Okay. Thanks, George. David. A couple points. Um, so back to the, the revocation and the, the percentages, I think 1% uh, could be very low. The, one of the reasons for revocation isn't that the a person loses access, but for verifiable credentials that the attributes have changed. So I've seen, uh, especially internal use cases, where you start to see people assign a lot more attributes even as high as 50% revocation because it's like HR uh, changed their uh, family name because they got married or changed their uh, reporting structure because they got promoted. All of those led to revocation and reissuance. Um, and, you know, we could also see like 86 million uh, 
citizens represented in a single uh, from a single issuer and it doesn't mean just like um, things like accumulators other approaches it doesn't mean we have to solve all those problems but i'd really like to see guidance on where and where this uh, shouldn't be used in terms of performance uh, in terms of w3c um, the, the issues that i saw uh, with that spec is, is one it's you know defined in terms of rdf using json ld but it's also a verifiable credential a w3c verifiable credential so as we start to see more use cases such as, such as access tokens for this uh, bringing in um, something like w3c verifiable credentials dids and all of those other uh, dependencies in order to be able to basically process whether or not an access token was still valid is it, just untenable. Thanks, David. Oliver. Yeah, to, to Live's point earlier, I think if you really want to support additional status methods, uh, specifically for credentials in the future, then this could be also done in the SD chart VC spec. So currently we have a pointer to status list as a uh, value for a status claim, um, which, you know, basically means go to status list, but in the future, if you really want to do something like cryptographic accumulators and so on, you could just define a new claim and, uh, and point to an, a different spec. So we don't need to solve it in the status list spec. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, everyone, for great discussions. And uh, we're done. See you Friday.